the last part of this chapter, we're going to take a look at methods of indirect proof. Indirect proof is broken down into two categories. Um, one of the more powerful methods is contradiction. And you probably remember from all the way back in the first section, in, is that if you have true and false as a statement P, we know that the negation of P is false or true. So we know that if the negation is false, that the original statement is true. And if the, if the original statement is false, the negation is true. So one of the ways that we might be able to prove something is by necessarily running into a contradiction by assuming the original statement is false. So what we're going to do is we're going to write the negation of the original statement. We're going to try to, and I'm going to put in quotation marks to prove the negation, which may not necessarily be possible. And then finally, if the negation is false, then we know by this truth table that the original statement must be true. Another method is called the contrapositive. You might remember that the contrapositive is logically equivalent to the original statement. And remember, the contrapositive states that if P implies Q, the contrapositive was not Q implies not P. And these two are logically equivalent to one another. Sometimes it's easier to verify or to prove the contrapositive instead of just proving the original statement. And then if the contrapositive is true, the original statement must be true as well. So these are the two methods. And we're going to look at a number of different examples as to how to prove um, by contradiction as well as contraposition. One of the classical examples is to prove that there is no least integer. All right. So here's our process for indirect proof. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start by writing negation. OK, so if we break it down into step one, um, write the negation. Okay. And here's how we do that. We just say, suppose not. OK. Suppose and the negation of there is no least integer. If we were to negate that, that would say that there is a least integer. All right. So that's what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to write the negation and then we're going to try to either prove or disprove it. So there is a least integer. So we're going to say suppose not, suppose there is a least integer. Okay. And let's say it's called M such that M is in Z. And we're going to say M is arbitrary but particular. Now, how do we get a contradiction for this? Well, we know that all we have to do is just subtract one from any integer, and it's less than that. So let's say, consider n equals m minus 1, where n is an integer as well. All right. um, so we can say, hence, n is less than m. All right, so this is the second part where we're going through and we're trying to prove a contradiction, all right? And clearly right here, n is less than m. However, m is the least integer. Um, this is a contradiction. Because what we've said is that, well, there is a least integer, but we just proved that there is another integer that's even less than the least integer. So it doesn't make sense. So then we can say, thus, the negation is false. And the original statement is true. Um, which means there is no least integer. Okay. 
right. So that's a pretty easy one. All right. I think most students could go through and they could say, OK, well, all I have to do is just subtract one or subtract five or 20 or whatever you want to and figure out that there really is no least integer. All right. So now a couple more examples of contradiction. So for all n in the integers, 3 does not divide 3n plus 2. All right. Um, and you could start plugging in integers like 1, 5, 7 for n. And if you plugged in 1, you get 5, which is clearly not divisible by 3. And if you plugged in 7, you get 23, which is not divisible by 3. And if you plugged in 5, you would get 17, which is not divisible by 3. So just for some basic cases, it looks like it's not true. Let's go ahead and write the negation of this, okay? And we clearly can say that the negation of this statement, if I was to negate this, that would be that three does divide three n plus two. All right, so first step, write the negation. We're gonna say, suppose not. Suppose that three does divide three n plus two, um, where n is an element of the integers, and we're going to say n is arbitrary but particular. All right. And again, we don't have to do that, but um, at, in another class, you might have to. All right. So by definition of divisibility, so remember, definition of divisibility means that this contains a factor of three or um, is also three times an integer. So we can say by definition of divisibility, um, we can say that three N plus two is equal to three P where P is an integer. Now here's the tricky part of this one is coming up with a contradiction, right? So, how are we going to come up with a contradiction? So this one's different than the previous because we can't just keep subtracting numbers because we're looking for divisibility. So here's the trick for this one. We're going to do some algebra, okay? So uh, we could say that 3n plus 2, which is equal to 3p, which is given, okay? So here's our second step is where we try to go through and find a contradiction. That's the same as saying 3n minus 3p is equal to negative two, right? And that's just by isolating or solving for negative two. That's just by um, just some basic algebra. I think everybody can see that that's pretty basic. Technically, it's the addition property of equality, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and wouldn't it be safe to say that we could factor out a three? So that's factoring. We could divide both sides by three. Okay, so that's by division. And then finally, what do we know about n minus p? Well, we know that n is an integer, right? So we go back up here, and where we defined n to be an integer, and we defined p to be an integer. So n minus p must be another integer by closure, right? Um, and we can call that something like q. All right, so n minus p is q, so we get q, which is equal to minus two-thirds, where q is an element of the integers by closure. So the question is, what is the contradiction? Well, we've just said that q is an element of the integers, but two-thirds is not an integer. And so that's our contradiction. All right, so we've encountered a contradiction. So thus, q is an element of the integers and q is equal to minus two thirds. Since q equals minus two thirds is not an integer, this is a contradiction. All right, so that's our contradiction that we finally encounter, all right? And then thus what we can say is to close this out, we can say, hence, the negation is false 
and the original statement is true. And hence, we can say that for all n in z, 3 does not divide 3n plus 2. Okay. So that's our contradiction. All right. And contradiction sneaky because a lot of times you're just trying to go through your algebra and hoping to encounter some sort of contradiction. All right. One last example of contradiction. So for all x in q, so for all rational numbers q, and for all irrational numbers y, x, y is irrational. All right, so we're going to negate this. And the negation is, is that we still have our domain, but we would say that x, y is not an irrational, or that's the saying that's saying x, y is irrational. So that's our negation. Okay. So let's say, suppose not, Suppose that for all x in Q, y in irrational, okay, and we're going to define x and y. So x and y are arbitrary but particular. So suppose that for all x and q and y and i, that x, y is in q. All right. So by definition of rational, what does that mean? So by definition of rational, we would say that x is equal to, let's just say, a over b. OK. Um, and again, a and b are integers. b is non-zero. And x, y is also rational. So we would say x, y is equal to c over d, where c and d are elements of the integers. Right? Um, and d would be non-zero. Now, I know that a and b share no common factors. c and d share no common factors. But we're just going to let that go for now. That's not necessarily part of this proof. All right. Now we're going to substitute because can't we just plug in a b right here? All right. So we've got we've gone through we've defined our variables we've written out what the um, what the specific um, negation is for this. So now let's go ahead and by substitution. Um, x, y equals c over d becomes a over b, y equals c over d. Right? So that's just our substitution. We can solve this for y. Okay? So y is going to be equal to c over d times b over a. And we should probably assume that a is non-zero. That's just one case to where it wouldn't be true. All right. Um, so that's one contradiction. But um, let's just assume that a is non-zero, um, which is this. And this is by multiplication, which is the same as y is equal to cb over da, again, by multiplication. And we know that C, B, D, and A are all integers. So what we could do is we could use closure, and we could one last time rewrite this as Y is equal to P over Q, where P and Q are integers. And that's by closure of integers. All right, so what does this mean? Well, P over Q is an element of the rational numbers, right? That's the definition of rational. So what we can say is that hence y is rational by definition of rational. So we can say y is an element of the rationals by definition of rational. 
All right. However, what else do we know about why? Well, didn't we define why all the way back up at the beginning as irrational? So it doesn't make any sense that a number is either rational or, excuse me, both rational and irrational. So we could say, however, y was defined as irrational at the beginning of the problem. So at the beginning of the, and I'm going to put this in quotation marks, the proof. All right. So this is a contradiction. Um, since no number is both rational and irrational. All right. And so thus the negation is false. So our last statement is thus the negation is false. And the original statement is true. And we can say, hence, for all x in q, y in i, we can say x, y is in irrationals, except for when x is 0. All right, so we should probably make the stipulation all the way back at the very beginning of the problem that x is non-zero. All right, um, that's the only case where that would be true. So unfortunately, there's just one counterexample, but let's just kind of throw that one out just because it's not really the one we're interested in. All right, so um, those are three examples of contradiction. And then in our last video in this section, we're going to take a look at two examples of being able to work with contraposition.